So I want to thank first everyone for being here this afternoon. Uh, I'm here. She already presented me. I'm here in the UK for an academic visit at the University of Edinburgh. And before coming here, I emailed some professors and researchers that I had met before, or that um, I had any kind of academic contact because of publications, books. And I was invited by Professor Nicole Vesmano for being here and talking about this project that we had last year in the study group I coordinate. I coordinate a study group, that's the name there, on contemporaneous criminology in Porto Alegre, that's a city in the south of Brazil. And we spent the whole year of 2018 studying and making some reflections, chronological reflections, on the data we gathered with this project. Uh, first of all, I would like to explain the terminology we are using here. Uh, this is, of course, we are not, not going to spend so, many, so much time talking about the expressions and terms, but it's important for me to explain that if this project leaked, for example, is a literal translation from the project we developed in Brazil. In Portuguese it's called Projeto Vazou. That's a pretty common verb. Vazar is the same as leaked. That's a catchy name, a catchy verb in Portuguese. That's why we use leaked, okay? And at the same time, we are using this expression non-consensual sharing of intimate images in Brazil because sharing is more used in Portuguese, the verb, than distribution for these cases. So I'm making like this literal translation uh, from the project we developed. What I'm going to show you here is explain, I'm going to explain to you the research we did, the results we collected, and what we thought based on this data. Okay? So we decided on the end of 2017 to start a project on something that would be like a, a new phenomenon, something that was not being studied in Brazil. And the best suggestion we had in the group was to study revenge porn. That's the common name also in Portuguese too. Okay? We are, we are calling here non consensual sharing of intimate images. Uh, but you can have other names, for example, image based sexual abuse. Professor Claire uses this expression that's much more complete. Uh, but here, anyway, we realized that much was being said about revenge porn or non consensual sharing, but we had few information about the characteristics of perpetrators and victims. We didn't know what were the apps that were being used. We didn't know the motives or drives of these and the consequences. Basically, we couldn't find anything because of low rate of reports. People don't report this kind of situation. And in criminology we have like this expression, when you have certain notifications, you have hidden figures. You don't know officially how many of these crimes happen. Uh, if we, we don't have official references for a street study, we had to collect this information. And this project was based on that, collecting this information from the victims. But before talking about that, it's interesting to try to understand why we had so much subnotifications. And this, we came across three hypotheses, in, at least in Brazil. Okay? The first one is what we call the shame sieves or the shame filters. This is an expression that's used in one article that's mentioned there, that's in Portuguese. Uh, when a person finds out that an image or a video has been leaked and shared without her consent, she might try to ask for help. And the first filter, the first scene she will have to face is to trust someone close, someone they know. 
and it's pretty hard by the narratives we got from the respondents, it's pretty hard to tell what happened to family and friends without being judged. Second, they might want to try professional help from therapists or from lawyers. In this case, in Brazil, we have this lawyer services, a private services, not from the government. Okay? But you have to trust this professional and open your life and your intimacy so you can have an assistance. And if this person, after those two layers, still want something more like a judicial relief, uh, any help from the court, they will have to trust police, judges and officials who mainly are not prepared to deal with this situation. In this case, we have many uh, problems of re-victimization. That's a problem when you have to face all these trust issues. Second hypothesis is that people might not report because they believe they are responsible for doing that. They took the risk. And it was really interesting that some of the answers we received and they were similar to other research. This is a research in the United States based on university. People, a lot of people believe they are responsible, they are the one to blame because the image was shared without consent. And third hypothesis we have is that based on the results which inform that most victims of this kind of violence are women, we identified a major silence among men. That could be a kind of a denial, they don't want to talk about it or they don't want to answer a research, or there is this possibility that they don't understand the exhibition of their intimate images, their private image as a violence, nor the society condemns them for that. In this presentation, I'll show you the, where you can download this presentation later. In this presentation, I, I didn't bring the, the most famous case that happened in Brazil, but in the Portuguese version, uh, it was there. But I can tell you, uh, last year, to prove this hypothesis, uh, we had elections in Brazil for state governor and for president. In the state of São Paulo, that's the richest state we have in Brazil, three weeks prior to the election, a video appeared in the country and the whole population had access to this video. In this video, it was depicted a candidate, a male candidate, uh, having sex with three or four young women. There is a discussion if this video is real or if it was like created, but the thing is, everyone had access to this video three weeks prior to the election. And he won the election. And we, at the same time we were talking about this project, we created this uh, reflection. And imagine what if it was the opposite? What if we had a female candidate voting for the state of Sao Paulo, the, the governor position, and we had a video of she sleeping with three or four young men? The election would be lost for her. That's interesting to compare. I didn't bring this case here, but if you look for Doria, that's the name of the governor, you'll find it on the internet. So, without data, we cannot understand the phenomenon. So, we created this project in Portuguese called Projeto Vazou. You can see it on the website address. Project Leaked, it means Project Leaked. It was catchy, this name. And we created this to gather information, especially from Victims. And how did we do that? We created a questionnaire online uh, with open-ended and closed questions and we were studying every meeting we had, all the answers and preparing this material. One thing that's interesting is that we got a lot of repercussion of this research. Mm. The research was broadcasted in newspapers, in radio programs, in TV shows, it, uh, I like to include the, on the top there, 
That's one of the most famous TV shows we have in Brazil, and I was invited to talk there about the project. But the interesting thing is, is and that's the reason why I'm presenting this slide to you, uh, we reached more people through the internet, through social media, through Facebook and Instagram. And why is that? Because our target group, it really revealed itself like this in the end, our target group does not read newspapers, read the newspaper. They don't watch TV programs in the morning. They are on the internet. So most responses came from Facebook and Instagram because that's what this generation that has within the, the generation, the perpetrators and the victims, they are using this kind of social network. Okay? So it's in interesting to uh, talk about that because when you're talking about methodology in research, if you want to reach a specific generation, you have to access their channels. Okay? What results we found? We received hundreds of answers and we considered valid only 141. What happened to the other ones? We excluded them because they were incomplete. We decided to exclude those who were not completed. And second and most important, we asked in the beginning of the questionnaire there was this, you cannot identify or mention any specific place besides the city where you live. That's it. That's only information we wanted to identify the region to make sure we were, talk, we were receiving answers from the whole country, and we did. So we asked that when writing or on their narratives, they didn't identify, and many people identified places and other perpetrators. Sometimes they mention their names, other they mention, oh, the guy works at the store, and they gave the name of the store. Oh, and the guy now has traveled to, and they mentioned the country he was visiting. All this information we excluded. So we had 141, which was pretty good to do a research of answers. And these answers are similar to the research we have read. Most of the victim survivors are either females. Okay, in our case, 84% were women. And they are very young, as you can see by the age. Uh, other research developed in different countries are telling the same things. In that paper uh, you sent me, Claire, I remember it specifically. There was like a note 13 mentioned other researches that had the same result. And of course, in the end here, most of those perpetrators those guys who leak and distribute are men. This, this is something interesting. The majority of the people that answered to our questionnaire, they knew who leaked the files. And from this group, 82% had had or was in a relationship at the time of their research with this person. This is really interesting because this kind of dismounts that myth of a stranger who hacks into the computer, the mobile phone. It's usually someone close who does that. And second, at least in our case, I don't know much about this in the UK legislation, but uh, once they have a relationship, you can ask the court for restraining notice for domestic violence, at least in, in Brazil you can do that. You have a kind of protection, uh, in Brazil, if someone is, is interesting, the law about domestic violence has a nickname that's a name of one victims. The nickname of the law is Maria da Pena. Okay, that it's, we have nicknames for us to to be easy to access. Another thing that's really interesting are the apps most used. You have Facebook, Facebook, Facebook Messenger, email, websites, uh, Instagram, and Snapchat. But what got our attention here was that there is one company that controls three of those mentioned apps. WhatsApp, Messenger, and Instagram, that appeared in a lot of answers. 
They are controlled by the same group, Facebook Corporation. And in our opinion, this makes this company implicated in this kind of violence. They are responsible for transmitting this kind of information. We're going to go back to this issue in a minute. More than half said they knew about the record and had authorized or sent it to the person. This is the case of sexting. Okay? Many people trust someone and send it to this original recipient with consent. And the problem happens later when this is distributed without new consent. Okay? Of course, when you're talking about sexting, uh, we have always to be aware that not always, as we put at the end of the slide, it's a consensual, 100% consensual, it's a 100% free will decision to send a picture. Many accounts we received alluded to threats, blackmail, and request as love proof, if you love me, send a picture. Okay, this is not uh, consent in our opinion, 100%. We ask about the reasons and motives for the respondents, uh, especially because, of course, to understand the motive or reason is kind of a uh, fiction to try to understand why the perpetrator did this. Uh, we are more mainly wor worried about harms done. But for the criminal law, at least in Brazil, knowing the motive is important. Because if you have a specific motive, you can increase punishment. Okay? Uh, for example, when they tried to criminalize, uh, they were not good enough to criminalize that in Brazil, okay? I will explain to you later. But when they tried to criminalize the revenge porn, there was like this description that uh, distributing or making available a sex, a sex scene or a nudity scene would have uh, the penalty of prison from this year to this year. If it was motivated by revenge, it would be increased the punishment. Okay, that's why we ask that. And of course, uh, revenge appeared in many answers. But also, we had, we were like shocked to discover that many of the share, much of the sharing, was without specific motivation. People just shared. Because this is a unreasonable, unreasonable part of this cultural dynamic, especially among men, to simply share what they receive. They didn't know or they didn't have a specific intent to harm anyone, they just reproduced this kind of violence without thinking. There were other motives like threats, uh, extortion, hacking, and we also included this exhibition of the image or video without sending it. That's the common action that if I receive a new picture right now, I don't send it to people, I just show, look at this. We included this action also in this research. What are the results? Results, we were pretty worried about that. They are terrible. The person who would select, uh, there were like multiple options to answer, but uh, in most cases they suffered from anxiety, social isolation, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and this is really horrible when you think that one third of those who answered the research self-mutilated themselves and thought about suicide. Uh, they, they were harassed in public space. It's not here. But this kind of harassment happened especially in small cities, when people know everyone, okay? Uh, there were dropouts, they lost their jobs, they had difficulties finding other jobs. And there were two different kinds of answers. A small group said they took advantage of the fact to start a positive action. What is that? Uh, one, for example, of the respondents said she created an NGO NGO in English? Yeah. Mm -hmm. NGO exactly to provide assistance to the victims. Uh, another one, she was a student, uh, she never identified in, if it was law, a student, sociology student. Uh, she had her video shared and she decided to 
to take a positive action and she chose this issue to study. She was studying uh, the normal sense of sharing since then. And some answered that they didn't bother with the leaking. But this is mainly the men who answered the, our research. Usually the men, they didn't care about the leaking. One of them was like really happy with that. Most families discovered and found out about the leaking. And from those who found about it, 43% reacted negatively. This is important when you mention this. How did you recover from the incident? Many of them said they didn't, have, they didn't recover. Uh, others looked for support groups, help from friends, empowerment programs. Some mentioned they, they needed psychological and psychiatric treatment. And you can see family support is one part of it. They had film support and this helped to recover from the incident. That's a number that's too low. In the majority of the cases, there was no police investigation and no court case. Especially, as we will see, there was no specific crime for you to deal with that. So people didn't know how to use the criminal system. And we asked, in the end, what do you want? What do you as victim want? Most of them wanted punishment of those who leave the fire, which is something expected. And we must remember that the victim is allowed to feel this way. And we have to understand this in the context. We are living in Brazil a moment of, that we call a punitive culture moment. People want much punish. People want, uh, when they say we want justice on TV, they want revenge, they want to kill criminals. So we have a lot of these, and this has been affecting answers and discourses in the recent years. Many want to remove the content, content from the internet. Someone, some of us, uh, some victims want to receive any kind of financial relief for this, this is from civil law, and others want the identification of those who leave the file, not only the first one, the primary distributor, but all the people involved in sharing, they want to know who did this harm to them. From this data, we elaborated four questions, basically. We wanted to know if romantic love was part of revenge porn etiology. I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. Second, we wanted to understand what is sexting. Third, is this a sign of crime? And four, is criminalization desirable? As criminologists, we should ask that about romantic love. While we were discussing uh, the data we get together, hmm, we felt the need to study this idea of romantic love, because historically speaking, we have many codes and architectures for relationships. And romantic love was created three centuries ago. This is new for our history. This is not something that old. Um, this creates an expectation that you will find someone that completes you and this person belongs to you. You've seen romantic movies, the cinema is full of that. Uh, and we still live with that love. And it's interesting to mention that when we started to the study romantic love, the study group, the consequence of this was that uh, most participants, they broke up their relationship and started new ones. So that's dangerous <laughs> to study. Okay. This will really happen. Uh, so we stay like we're in this culture of romantic love, reinforced by a sexist culture, and, and we can feel that 
With romantic love comes the idea of controlling and possess possessing someone. This is part of me. And when I end this relationship, usually you have violence to reinforce that this control still exists. Okay? And many people mention in our research that the sharing of the intimate images was a form to humiliate, harass, or punish this partner for leaving this relationship. The other person lost control and decided to do that. Uh, the frustration caused by the failure in accomplishing this perfect relationship that is managed by romantic love may be the cause of many kinds of violences in relationships. This can foster control, frustration, submission, objectification. So, is a field we need to study a little further because it might be in the root of many different violences, especially, especially domestic and gender violence. The second thing that called our attention was the sexting, this new culture of sexting. We had, as you have seen before, most of these violence come from intimate people. And second, there was a initial consent for the exhibition of this image in this video, and that it was later shared without consent. Uh, and we were trying to understand what was happening here. What was happening was this was sexting. That's a kind of transmission of sexually explicit and suggested messages or images, we call them nudes, uh, through mobile phones. And when we came to this, we discovered there is a whole literature debating about sexting. Many of them have this idea that in sexting you have like a reproduction of the power relation exerted by men against women in this new cyberspace. Okay? It's like we are doing gender as women exposing our bodies and men are doing gender consuming and incentivating this, you know. On the other side, there are those who believe that this first idea is kind of victimizing and they have come to believe that sexting in cyberspace and this kind of communication is an opportunity uh, to represent authentic experiences and with the potential of rewriting the codes of sexuality. So there is this huge debate and we present this in the paper. Okay, I forgot to say that. Uh, I can go back to that slide later, but you can download this presentation on that website that was written there, www.projectrazo.com. Uh, and there, in the near future, you have like the whole final paper we have written on the research and you have this in details, this debate here. We have not made it available because it was submitted to a journal and it's not published yet. But the thing is about sexting, we were worried uh, and we were trying not to judge what was going on. Because in most papers, in most debates, in most campaigns about this kind of phenomenon, uh, there was always a message that this young generation was being reckless, was being naive in this kind of communication. And we didn't like this idea. We think it's a genera gener generational matter. Uh, it's a new way of understanding intimacy, sexuality, it's a new way of identification and communication. And we try to avoid this perspective that tries to judge other generations. And especially because this has the risk of throwing back to the victim the responsibility of the violence. You know, like this. 
Uh, this is a campaign that was developed by an NGO in Brazil called SaferNet, which is a great uh, NGO. They are really worried about violence in the internet and privacy. And they had this campaign, I translated the balloons there, the internet doesn't keep secrets, keep your privacy offline. And we believe this is trying to invert the responsibility. The girl there depicted that she is not responsible for the violence. Who are responsible for this violence are those other morons that are replicating without consent. And third, we have this question about is this a cyber crime? Because if you think about that, you have a new technology, you have new equipment, this is happening in social media platforms. Uh, can we consider this a cyber crime? It's kind of hard to say what's cyber, what's not cyber, but we kind of need to define that. I remember one case when I was in another, I was living in another city called Curitiba. Nowadays, Curitiba is famous because it's where our former president is arrested. Okay? And I was living there and working as a lawyer. And I went to the police station that was specialized in cyber crimes because I was working in one, one case. And the, what we would call that, the police chief of this station was really angry because he had a lot of work and, she showed, and he showed me uh, an investigation that one, two people, they were like colleagues, they were co-workers in the company and they had an argument and they had injured themselves and one of them threw the mouse, the computer mouse, in the direction of the other one. And this, this was sent to the police station specialized in cyber crimes because the means that was used was computational. So we need to understand what is cyber crime, what is not cyber crime. This is real, this is not a joke, this happened. Yeah. Uh, and I like, I mentioned uh, this lady who was a professor here. Uh, I like his categorization because he divides cyber crimes in generations. Uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure we can talk about this later, uh, but we identify that this kind of conduct, this kind of behavior, is more likely to be a hybrid cybercrime or a cybercrime from second generation. Because it's something traditional, it's a traditional crime with a traditional motive. However, carry out through new accessible technological means, and in this case, this potentializes the effects. Criminalization in Brazil, that was the fourth question. What happened? How is it nowadays? Uh, we did not have, like many countries, we did not have any specific legal framework for what we are calling here revenge farm, for non compensation distribution. So we had to resort to our traditional crimes. Crimes against the honor, as we call it in Brazil, defamation, insult, threat, sometimes extortion. If the video depicted a rape scene, it was rape. If there was a child involved, child pornography, we had to get the traditional crimes. But last year, we had two reforms in our criminal code. In Brazil we have a criminal code and special laws. Okay? We had two reforms inserting two different crimes in the criminal code with the intention to criminalize revenge porn. But we still don't have a criminalization. And I will explain quickly what happened. On September, that First law, you can see that, inserted this article 218C in our criminal code saying that it was a crime to disclosure, uh, sex, nudity, or porn scene. 
Okay, it looks perfect for you to criminalize revenge porn. The problem is they have inserted the article in the wrong chapter. <laughs> what happened here? The chapter that starts in 217 talks about vulnerable victims of sexual crimes. In our case, the criminal code says who are the vulnerable people in this case. Vulnerable people in Brazil, in this case for sexual crime, uh, people under 14 years old, children. But if this happens, there is a specific law for to protect kids. Second, those people who have any kind of mental problem that won't allow this person to understand what's happening, this is considered vulnerable people, victim for uh, sexual crime. And third, someone who's, who at the moment of the sexual act is impossible to give a consent because she's not understanding the reality, the context. For example, if a person is intoxicated, okay, this is considered a vulnerable, vulnerable victim. Uh, it means that if a woman in her 20s is dating someone, they share new pictures, they break up, and the guy decides to leave those pictures, she's not protected by this because she's not vulnerable in our system. So it didn't work. Then on December 20th, they tried to correct this, and they inserted a new crime, 216B, now in the right chapter, okay, above the chapter of the Bible, uh, saying it was a crime, the unauthorized record of sexual intimacy, the creation. And, uh, okay, this was well done, but the thing is, it refers only to recording, not leaking or sharing. And what happened here? When the bell, the, bell, the view was going to be enacted, it was, they had two new articles, one of recording and the second one was about distribution. But the moment it was going to be enacted, our lawmakers identified that they already had the other article above, 218, so they didn't need to criminalize distribution again. And they lost the opportunity again. That's the second time. So, is it criminalized in Brazil? They tried. <laughs> but the distribution is not criminalized. To conclude, is it desirable? Uh, I don't know where you come from, if it's criminology, sociology, or all of them, but I believe it's from these areas. And we know that the justice system is not answering very well to some situations. The remedy is late, uh, the victim is not properly addressed, the problem is not really solved. You're talking about retribution instead of preventing new violence. So we don't believe much in justice system. Uh, are there alternatives? Yes, restorative justice is one possibility, but we decided to map non-judicial measures, okay, like creative solutions, as I put here. And there are four possibilities for this case that we identified in what we searched. First, there are mechanisms in operation, in operation that, for example, Google, you can uh, inform Google that a picture was shared without the consent and they take it out from the search engine. You know, they don't remove the content, it just, you can't find the picture or the video. Uh, second, the, that's my favorite one, you can program artificial intelligence uh, to avoid this kind of behavior violence. Facebook is trying to do this, there's a pilot project and it's trying to do this also in the UK, I can talk about this later. Uh, and this follows the idea of seeing the cyberspace as a code, a constitution, you can regulate and it can adapt behavior, human behavior, by programming. Uh, third, 
when this was really fun to discover, you can you have reactions that are related to haptidism. That's another virus answering to the, to the first virus. Uh, we found, for example, there's a feminist hacker group in Brazil that hacks into the perpetrator's mobile phones and they destroy all the files. That's a possible solution we identified. They can do this by doxing a public chain also. And of course, you have like uh, consciousness, consciousness raising and sex education, which we try to do because we wanted to give like a contribution to society in our research. Uh, we thought about broadcasting some posts informing about this, like those you can see. We made this suggestion for schools to explore myths and truths and it was really nice to see that uh, that five years and we had also this discussion about myth and truth uh, and instructions for people victims usually don't know what to do when this happens and we developed uh, a step-by-step -step instruction for them to look for help uh, I think my time is done here. I just want to thank you all. This is my study group. Mainly there are other people with this participated in this project. And I think uh, one last message. Uh, I think it's important for a way to establish this kind of partnership this kind of communication, I was very happy to be invited to speak here and even more happy to discover you guys are researching the same thing it's a world problem we are facing and I really like to make these connections because in a world that many people are building walls I think we have kind of a responsibility to build bridges and I hope we can build one in future research. That's it. I'm open for questions.